Hello and welcome. It is great to be back with you on Palace Confidential. It's your weekly look at all things royal brought to you by The Mail. I'm Jo Elvin and this week it might not surprise you to learn that we are taking a close look at the revelations from Prince Harry's memoirs entitled Spare and the numerous interviews he's done to promote it. And here to discuss that family breakdown, intimate cushions and a whole lot more are The Daily Mail's royal editor Rebecca English and The Daily Mail's diary editor Richard Eden. Welcome. I've missed your faces. Welcome back. Happy New Year. Nice to be back. Now, Rebecca, we're going to start with you. Um, you've had a couple of days to digest the book Spare. Overall thoughts? Easy to condense? Well, I mean, I've now read this book three times cover to cover in two different languages, so I feel like I Pardon? have... Oh, because did you read the Spanish, Spanish version? Yeah. yeah. Uh, although some of his descriptions of intimate personal areas kind of challenged my O-level Spanish, put it that way. <laughs> I'm sure I, we'll get onto that later. I actually don't believe that for a second, but carry <laughs> well, on. I'm sure we'll get yeah. onto that later. But actually, like, and overwhelmingly, actually, in, on a kind of serious note, was one of genuine sadness, actually. Sadness for that 12-year-old Harry that lost his mother in horrific circumstances. Um, I've got a child the same age, and I found that stuff really difficult to read. And I think sadness at the the trauma that has perpetuated his life because of that uh, and his inability to grieve properly and sadness at the implosion of his family relationships. Yeah. Um, but, and it is a really big but, the book is so full of nastiness, of spite, of you know vitriol thrown at family members who, from what I can see, are really nothing guilty of nothing more than um, of just not being able to handle things in the right way. and. Um, the kind of the festering of kind of small family squabbles that you know have c normal things that happen in families that have kind of clung with him and he's kind of ruminated on for decades and and also I think um, a kind of a lack of accountability um, for his own actions you know he the book is billed as the kind of hard-won wisdom he's learned throughout his life but he never once admits that he did anything wrong and I think all of that uh, really kind of leaves a bit of a nasty taste in the mouth as well. What was the tweet I saw you doing yesterday about something about, was it a parking space? Or I mean, yeah, there was a part that he, <laughs> I mean, the ghostwriter, I must say, can I just say, has done a brilliant job. It's a really well written book. It is, book, yeah. And it's one that he's drawn a lot out of his subject. But some of the, you know, the mundane things that Harry is kind of, built up to be great personal slights which is you know he was put in what he called the basement flat in Kensington Palace note it's a palace yeah <laughs> um, and it had three windows three tall windows in it but he said he wasn't really able to distinguish between you know sunlight noon and 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 the night you know try telling that to someone in a high-rise tower block um and that the next door neighbor used to park his car and it would block his light and he wrote a letter basically saying don't get in that parking spot. Can you park, you know, two, three inches back? And the guy wrote back to him and said, get lost, basically. And then he moaned about how that person's wife had a haircut and used to throw her hair clippings <laughs> out of the window. And you're like, honestly, that, you know, that probably happens, you know, issues over parking spaces and yeah, I get, I, on a daily basis. Harry, but you know what? I'm not going to write a book about it in 20 what? years' time. Harry's had a more authentic London living experience than I, than I first thought. But <laughs> Richard... You know, obviously our viewers are hugely interested in the royal family and it, and it does paint a rarely seen portrait of life of the firm, doesn't it? It's quite fascinating. It really does. I mean, it's it's an engrossing book and as Rebecca says, it's, it's brilliantly written and I think friends of Harry will find it quite hard to square actually with um, the Harry they know. I'm not sure or he's really, yeah. or knew, yeah, yeah. They, they, they've re he's really captured him. Um, you know, it's super eloquent. He's this sort of waspish journalist, and it it reads like a sort of investigator who's gone in and infiltrated the royal family, and just given wonderful descriptions. I mean, let's remember how this book's been written. Harry has sat down for hours and hours, and his highly talented ghostwriter has interviewed him. He's said, you know, what was it like? How did you feel? What did it look like? And then he's created this book around it, and. Um, you know, the, the descriptions are amazing and it's, yeah, very evocative, but just so cruel. You know, it's one of the most unkind books I think I've ever read. You know, generally with 
with books, you know, autobiographies, people want to sort of show a balanced light or something like that. But here, you know, every description, or even like pretty much the first description of Prince William is his, you know, prematurely balding brother and stuff like this. Yeah, I it's, think Harry needs to be careful with that one. Yeah, really yeah. weird. Yeah. But, but it's, it's too sort of obviously unkind as well. There's no sort of subtlety in that. You know, and this this idea that he's been putting around this week in all these interviews that he sort of wants this great rapprochement with the royal family. Well, no, you know, it really didn't read like that. Yes, I think Rebecca, we we always knew that we would read that it was a sad state of affairs in the relationship with the royal family and Harry, and particularly mm. between the brothers. But I, I don't think anybody has really comprehended quite how bad it it, it was going to read in this book. Yeah, and I, the one thing that kind of made me laugh slightly ironically is all those stories that myself and other people who work on the Royal Beat have written over the years about the estrangement between the brothers and the issues that were going on behind the scenes that were roundly denied yes. or the palace refused to comment on the time uh, have pretty much all proved to have been true because Harry has confirmed themselves himself in the book. Um, and. I mean, I wrote a piece a couple of years ago saying, you know, there's a lot of focus on Kate and Meghan and the kind of war between the two women, but that's actually pretty misogynistic and yeah. very sexist and actually ignores the real story, which is the the falling out between the brothers. And again, I got a lot of grief for it at the time, but, you know, Harry himself admits that he hasn't spoken to his brother or his father or his stepmother, really any family member apart from possibly his cousin, Princess Eugenie, for a long while. And as Richard said, on the basis of this book, I don't see that changing. What he seems to lack is kind people who care for him now, around him. And this is what I find disturbing about his marriage to Meghan, I'm sorry, but, Someone who genuinely cared for him would say to a lot of these things that, Harry, honestly, don't include that. You make yourself look silly or this is not good. But, you know, when I'm listening to audio last night of him talking about, um, oh, don't, you know, don't. talking about using his mother's I favorite cream say. on his penis. You know, please. It, it, this say is, that on Palace no, Hill. There's the YouTube segment. No, <laughs> no, sorted. No one, yeah. no one wants to hear this. And anyone who cared for him would say, look, Harry, just don't include it. But instead, he's got people who want, they want money, money, money. You know, ghostwriter, publisher. They're boasting about how many copies this has sold. Great. You know, Prince William could turn around tomorrow and write a book, I'm sure, that's even more extraordinary, would make lots of money. But, you know, we've, he's got dignity. Mm. He's not going to do that. The issue about the brothers is fascinating. I mean, Harry's... It's obsessional, his relationship with his brother in this book, and it's, it's quite disturbing, actually, in parts. This, as you say, this, the, the kind of suggestion that he was only ever born because they wanted to cultivate him as a spare part, a, you know, a spare kidney if William ever suffered a problem. It's actually really insulting to his parents mm. because, by all accounts, he was a very much wanted and a much-loved child, um, but he he really has barely a nice word to say about his brother. I mean, it gives Cain and Abel a run for its mo yes. money. It, it's, it doesn't strike me as healthy at all. And Willie, as he's we, we've learned for the first time he, he's called, comes in for the roughest ride from our Harold. He, he really does throughout. But then before, there were some reports saying how actually um, King Charles doesn't come across too badly, relatively, but no, I don't think so. I mean, he he's this sort of frail, doddery old man who's, you know, just doesn't know how to sort of act with people. And and, yeah. yeah um, but, but William, every mention of William, you know, it's like with um, stepmother Camilla, every mention, you sort of feel like there's going to be some sort of booming, it's like pantomime figures, you know, it's mm. just really, right. really dripping with vitriol. And speaking of that, I was really surprised at just how comparable it is with something like the TV show Succession with all the competitiveness between not just the brothers, but the family and this, this extraordinary bit where Harry talks to Rebecca about doing conservation work in Africa and William saying, rhinos, elephants, that's mine. I mean, are things that petty, really? I, look, do you know, I mean, I think you have to be fair about this book and call things out when it's not right, but equally, you know, confirm when things 
are are pretty much spot on and actually I, I could see that happening but I don't think it's in a petty way I mean the royal family get hundreds of requests every year for them to be patrons of various charities and people will often go and I've you know heard other members of the royal family saying going oh reading I like that or oh you know I want to speak out about violence against women or you know sexual violence women against well you know they 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 want to grab something that will play to their strengths and they can feel they can speak passionately about I suppose the difference for William and Harry was that they're both really into conservation in in Africa but I think again this leads back into this whole kind of Cain and Abel scenario with Harry and his brother William probably just said oh I'm really into rhinos I've done a lot of conservation work out in Kenya but Harry has kind of built it up to be yet another kind of log on this you know pyre of resentment he has against his brother for being the first born and getting first dibs on everything. Well, the, the problem is that so many of their interests were intertwined because mm. um, on the face because of it. Because we thought they were friends. Exactly yeah. because yeah. we thought they all they got on so well but if you look at their shared interests it was Africa conservation work with mental health you know they launched and the that Hiki nightclub they, <laughs> they launched that heads yeah. together yeah. And, yeah. and we all thought that was a sign of what a great team they were going to be and when there was the the only ever meeting of the Royal Foundation the public announcement and the, the press coverage sort of fab four type thing that was because we felt this is great this is going to be them working together so it seemed natural so for them to then hear that you know, there was the great disputes. It is is a surprise. What do you make, Richard, of this suggestion that Charles and Camilla were behind the leaking of stories against Harry? Wow, yeah. I mean, you know, as I mentioned, Camilla comes across um, terribly badly. Um, and we see what we see. I have to kind of talk quite carefully because um, their cheerleader, um, Omid Scobie, he mentioned about how after the final draft of this book was submitted to the publisher, the lawyers had 41 pages of questions. So I think... Only 41? It's <laughs> pretty good. You know, sometimes with my copy, as a social diarist, there's lots of red marks and questions. And uh, as I know, that will mean that lots of things have been struck out. So I think this book could have been a lot worse. But what, we, what, we, um, what was published and what we've heard is that it was all to do with the rows um, between the falling out over the bridesmaids dresses and between Catherine and Meghan and all those disputes. Now, um, Harry and Meghan were really shocked that this came out in a news report they felt was completely wrong that had come out in, in one of the papers and they wanted to find out how. So they got together, I think they had dinner with William and Catherine and they said to them, you know, who could have leaked this? What member of staff? And they were sort of grilling them. And then William said, you know what, actually, when you were away, we did have dinner with Charles and Camilla, and I did mention that we'd had tensions between us and there'd been some tears. And then Harry said, oh, dear, so that's how it's come out. So oh, wow. the strong implication was that was through their father and his wife. Mm. But then it gets even worse because he said that later I heard some... William really upset about something that had come out. Now, he doesn't say what that was, um, probably for legal reasons, um, but he says that William had learned that that had come out through Charles and Camilla or their office. So it doesn't go into great details, but the strong, well, more than an implication mm. is that a highly damaging story about William came out via his father and his wife. So he was, it, it's really bad. You know, That's he's explosive. using that. Yeah. yeah, he's using that to, he's dragging in William to do more damage to to his father and and we see that throughout i think this it really is a, a calculated book to do as much damage as possible to, to the monarchy and to the future tell us straight rebecca harry talks repeatedly and has done on various interviews about this idea that the leaking of stories about family members to improve their images or trade stories to sort of like have a have a bad story taken out of you don't write this I'll give you this story about this member of the royal family how is that a thing no 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 <laughs> I mean I just I actually feel like I'm boring myself now saying this but it it really is true I mean I can only speak from personal experience and I think 
when you go back from what I hear in the 80s and 90s, that whole kind of infamous War of the Whales period, there was a lot of briefing going on. But I certainly know when I came into doing this job, which is more than 15 years ago, I have not had a single member of the royal family discuss another member of the royal family with me. Um, I have never had a member of staff ringing me saying, or you know, emailing or whatever, saying, Rebecca, will you not run this story about, negative story about one member because we've got this great story about Harry and Meghan, for example, that you could run instead that won't paint them in a good life. It just doesn't happen. Um, you know, the palace's default position is computer says no, I always say, especially when it comes to talking about members of the royal family in a personal capacity. It, it just does not happen. It is a total flight of fancy on his behalf. And all I can do think is that he is replicating what he experienced as a as a young child and he saw going on between his parents to what's happening now and that's just not my experience of it. it so really as is. a social diarist I'd be in a position for them to leak negative stories or whatever but no it, I mean they try and avoid me as much as possible but that um, what what I might get is I might put a story that I've heard to the to the press office and they might say look for, you know for guidance that's not accurate and, and they might tell me the truth or um, steer me away from something which is why we ring them mm. Um, it's an important but, part but of the system of checks and yeah, balances. Yeah, and, and I wish Harry had done that with this book because he so hasn't I, done any of that. I just get the feeling that, you know, that, and there will always be people who are sceptical of that, that line, and even if it is true, it's just I think that Harry believes it. Harry believes that that is the case, doesn't he? I, I, he does, and yeah. it's someone who's very well plumbed in and very sensible said to me, you know, it is clear Harry believes what he's saying it's as true to him as it is untrue to everybody else. Mm. Um, whether it's that he's, he's, I mean, he admits in his book he's had trouble remembering some things and he's had therapy that's helped him to deal with that. He's had, you know, he found the, the book, writing the book a cathartic experience. Whether he has started to kind of pin what he remembers as a young boy on what actually happened now. Um, you know, I, it's very difficult for journalists to talk about where stories come from, but I, I you know, it is far more, I would say, cock up than conspiracy. Yeah. To put a, you know, what, think of, trying to think of a better phrase to, you know, you hear little bits here, you hear a little bit here, you start pulling things together. And as Richard said, an important part of that is speaking to palace officials and saying, I've heard that, because you have to give people the chance to either confirm or deny it. Well, but the act of leaking or planting of stories is a very different thing. They would be sacked, that's the thing. 100%. They would be so nervous because if it came out that this story had come from someone, that individual would be sacked. Yeah. Mm. So they're not stupid, they're not gonna risk their jobs. Well, Harry, uh, we've always known of Harry's disdain for senior courtiers at the palace, much like mm. his mother, but some even in lower down the pecking order don't come out too well either, do they? This is, this is really important, and I think this is why um, some of the staff should be allowed to ignore the non-disclosure agreements. To, the palace should rescind those agreements so that they can speak out, because Harry libels um, a lot of staff in this book, you know, and, and I've been able to identify people quite easily from, wow. and so others will have identified lots of people. To give one example, um, he says that Meghan um, accepted freebies um, that were given to her by designers and other people trying to win favour with the royal family. Now this is a really complicated area. They have to be disclosed. Generally, I think they have to be refused. I think in some cases you can keep them if they're registered, but it's a really complicated grey area. Well, he says that Meghan accepted them, but she shared them out with staff. So that means that those staff are complicit in accepting these freebies. Mm. And there's an issue there that they might want to address. No, they might want to say, we, we didn't want to, we only did it because she told us to. Then he goes into specifics and he talks about how one um, aide, I won't, I'll try not to be too specific, was sacked because she'd been trading on her links to Meghan. Mm. Now, you know, I know who that individual is and others will have easily identified this person. Um, so that's, that's pretty dodgy. You know, the, the lawyers have made lots of changes to his book, I'm sure. But it's so unfair that staff, long-serving staff, often not on great pay, they, they like to work for the royal family sometimes because it helps, it's good for your CV, move on to other jobs. And they're having this um, that will be a stain on their reputation. So I really think they should be able to 
hit back. Well, watch this space. I'm sure people are seeking comments from them as we speak. But it's fair to say that the subject of spare has got lots of you talking as well. And let's take a look at some of your comments now. First of all, Laura Resnick says, realistically, how can anyone in Harry's family ever again have a serious private conversation with him, knowing that he has, without their permission, and I think it can be assumed against their wishes, publicly shared so many of their previous private conversations and encounters? Yeah, I think I'm sort of with you on that one. I mean, lo lots of you writing with your support for the Prince and Princess of Wales as well. And one of those is Sally T. Aitchison Gould, who writes, the constant sniping at William is to get him to react. Hope William doesn't give him the satisfaction. And finally, Susan Whitfield commented after Tom Bradby's interview with Harry, saying the Duke claimed to have never accused the royal family of being racist, but accepted an award for calling out racism in the royal family. I mean, I was puzzled by that one. <laughs> Tom should have picked him up on that. So please do keep those comments and questions coming in and leave them below. You can email us on palace at mailplus.co.uk or let us know on social media where we are at mailplus. Well, it's not just the spare revelations that has Harry in the headlines. He's also had lots to say in various publicity interviews for the book. Rebecca, after some serious sit-downs, he spoke to a more light-hearted Stephen Colbert this week. That was quite an eye-opening chat, wasn't it? It was a bit cringe, if we're going to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was being kind. Yeah. Um, obviously, they wanted to round off this, you know, uh, this kind of blitz of publicity was something that was just a little bit different, a little bit less intense. And, you know, I, I, have been on, I haven't watched The Late Show before. I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know who this person was, Stephen Colbert, who was interviewing me. Very good interview. gets a lot out of his subjects. Um, whether Harry should have said, again, half the stuff he did is another question. But it started off with this slightly embarrassing skit, which was basically Harry being kind of uh, playing a character, turning up to the show and uh, the host waiting there with trumpeters in outfits that mimic the state trumpeters outfits and Harry going oh no you didn't have to put this all on for me and then he's oh, no, it's not from you get out the way get out the way and Tom Hanks walks around the corner and then Harry starts showering him with rose petals um I mean yeah, look, that I, does I don't, sound quite cringe I don't want to be yeah. po-faced about it because actually ha Harry came across very well on this program I thought he came across as you know very warm very easy to talk to very open but it was a bit end of the peer show I think for a member of the royal family I have mm. to say and I, if that's the route he wants to go down yeah, I'm not sure that's the right decision. Well, there was also, Richard, the suggestion that the royal family was working hard with the British media to undermine the book. What do you think about that? I think it's all these years, um, all this time that Harry's spending in America away from this country, he's, he's becoming more and more sort of paranoid or more weird for you. Like, how have they undermined it? They, they, they've made a policy of, of not doing anything. And they haven't been. They you know, haven't been responding at all. I think, you know, my goodness, I mean, what, what patience, what, um, you know, understanding by William and Catherine not to say anything when they've got someone trying to, you know, trash their reputation. Um, so I think he just sort of throws out these accusations like that. Oh, the royal family's been cleaning the press. It, it just doesn't really, doesn't have much impact because it doesn't bear any any relation to reality. He's also criticised, hasn't he, the idea that the media on reporting the book have taken things out of context. And very, you know, the centre of that storm is this thing in the book where he talks about killing 25 mm. Taliban insurgents and complained that the media have taken it out of context. What, would you have a response to that? Yeah, and I, he's right. Context is very important, which is why we took great efforts to make sure that we um, anything that was uh, taken from that was taken from its entirety of what he said and that we were very careful in the choice of language. And what's interesting, I think, is that my colleague who wrote that particular story has gone back to the people that commented at the time and they said, no, we absolutely stand by our comments. We don't think it was right for him to write about the exact number of people that he had killed and also refer to them as pieces on a chessboard that needed to be taken out. And interestingly, in the Late Show programme, Harry says the reason why he wrote that was because he wanted to prevent uh, suicide amongst veterans. And actually, 
my colleague has gone and spoken to families who said we're very angry we have lost people who've taken their own lives as a result of what they went through in war and we don't want to see their grief being used by him in this way Gosh. so you know I, I, I think everyone stands by their reporting of that and I should say that Harry only mentioned the press in the late show and of course Actually, it was covered by every leading the bulletin of every television, you know, every radio station around the world. But of course, Harry has such a fixation on the British press, the newspapers, that he only referred to it in connection with us. Mm. Richard, uh, on to slightly lighter matters, the issue of, shall we say, the intimate cushion came up as well, didn't it? Oh, blimey, there's so many to... Um... So glad you got asked this question. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm giving you the easy ones. <laughs> to yeah. remember. Um, yeah. So to summarise this, this huge story, um, or little story, um, depending how you want to see it. I just want to know how I can unknow it. Essentially, um, Harry went on two trips um, to the Arctic, didn't he? Was it North Pole and South Pole? I'm not sure. But the first one... Um, he had, um, it was very cold, as you can imagine, and he suffered as a result, and he particularly suffered in, in his nether regions. Um, and that was just before um, Prince William and Catherine's wedding. So he had, I think, what he described as a frozen todger during the wedding. Um, and as, a great image, isn't it? As mentioned earlier, he had to um, use a cream recommended, which happened to be his um, mother's favourite skin cream. It's a very good cream. Joe's face is an absolute I, I didn't picture. know. I, I don't know if I would have advised it for such um, an injury, but I've never been asked the question. So, but no, it is a very good cream. Yeah. But he used this cream to um, fix himself while thinking of his mother. Um, but before he took the next trip to the... Um, frozen air of the world, he um, had a cushion, which apparently is, is very straightforward. He didn't need to suffer in that way in the first trip. So the second one, he had a cushion to protect him, and that kept his... Um, what his... kind of... A, what do you mean a cushion? Well, I think it's just a protection, so you keep that part of your body warm. OK. Um, well, what he, what he explained... I can't believe we're even discussing this. Like I'm, Something I never thought would be discussing towards the end of last year, <laughs> we'll be discussing at the start of this year, but apparently... Even though it's minus 35 outside, you're wearing lots of very warm clothing, which makes you sweat, and the sweat drips down. And well, it's... they should have sent Prince Andrew then, shouldn't they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, really. Yeah. And then that then freezes, and that obviously caused frostbite to his nether regions. Can so we just you, please you, hope there's you no... You get royal gossip, you get biology, you get a lot with us. Please, can there be no sequel to this book? I can't take it anymore. I think, I don't know, what was that, what is that deal? They must make what their pound of flesh. Well, I have to say, it did result in me writing the sentence I never thought I'd write, which is in the book, that when he talks about the wedding and obviously the medical issues he went through, he said, what was the universe trying to tell me? That I was going to lose my brother and penis at the same time. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I have beautiful. no words. It's just beautiful. Um, the issue of context, has Rebecca been another way to defend himself as in, the, you know, no, there's nothing, there's nothing to criticise in this book. Anything that you don't like about it is because of the way the media has reported it. Yeah, I mean, context has obviously become Harry's new buzzword and one that he's clearly going to use a lot. Uh, the one thing I think you've got to understand about ha Harry and, and in my dealings with him over the years when he was a working member of the royal family. Control was a really big issue to him. You know, when you would talk to him, he clearly felt frustrated about the lack of control he had in his private life and also in his well, public I, life. I think that that's, that's a classic when someone's been through that kind of trauma, mm. isn't it? Yeah, ex yeah. exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I have a certain amount of sympathy for him with that, that, you know, it... He, he couldn't control any aspect of his life. And I think what we've seen in the last couple of years, without kind of playing an armchair psychologist about it, but is him resting back that control, both privately and publicly. Um, but he seems to kind of want to control every aspect of this. And this is something that any public figure has to come to terms with, that you can't do that. And if he's going to put himself out there in such an, an open public manner, that he's got to understand that people, and I don't just mean journalists by that, but members of the public, will seize upon bits that they think are more interesting than others and use it to shape their opinion of him. Mm. Um, and that is a risk he has taken with putting out this book. Well, yes, Richard, we know, obviously, we know he hates the media, um, particularly the tabloids. What, what do you think 
the end game is? Do you think it's it's at all possible that this is like, here's my story, here it is, and now I'm not going to say another word? What what's what's the goal? I think, in all seriousness, he he wants to destroy the monarchy. I know he said on the. Tom Bradby interview that he still supports it, but I don't think so. I think he's he's trying to portray his father, who's you know yet to be crowned, as an irrelevance, an old man just in hock to his um, domineering, scheming wife. He's trying to sort of dismiss Charles, and his really his real target is his brother. He wants to destroy the very positive image that people generally have of William and Catherine. He wants to do as much damage as possible. I'm not quite clear if it's a sort of just a thing of sort of carpet bombing trying to destroy because he can't have it or if he hopes to become king himself I don't know I mean he... or, to, or that there is no such thing as the monarchy I don't I don't know yeah. See, I, slightly, I slightly disagree I, well I agree with some of what you say and disagree with others I, I don't think he wants to destroy the monarchy I think he wants to destroy the media and any particularly any media that he can't control. Well, he but, made that clear in the yeah, Tom Bradby interview. Exactly. He said he wants us to be closed down. Yeah, he, he, he wants to destroy the media, and he doesn't really care what collateral there is in his journey to do that. And if the collateral happens to be the reputation of his nearest and dearest, it doesn't matter. That's obsessive so, behaviour, isn't it? That's the thing, it really is. Um, but, uh, yeah, his end game is, is negative, and I think there's, there's going to be a lot more to come. You know, we've got rumours about Meghan writing a book and it, there's a lot left out of this book that she'd be keen to write about, I'm sure. Wow. Well, the royal family, Rebecca, going back to work, has anything changed with them? You know, any sign of a statement or a response at all to... Yeah, let's just end this all on a bit of positivity. So oh, OK. To, yeah. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> think that, that, would, that was going to get me a positive answer, actually. No, yeah. uh, well, today the royal family are back out in, in action. Um, we've got uh, His Majesty the King out in Scotland visiting a group there that uses crafts and um, uh, other social activities to help people who've got... Uh, who are kind of not socially... Uh, included in kind of very rural settings and you've got William and Kate, the Prince and Princess of Wales um, who are in Liverpool, they're opening a hospital and they're going to a uh, youth mental health organisation so you've actually got them out and about doing actually which is focusing on what they really want to focus on which is the work, the public work that they do um, and I don't think that line from the palace that um, they are trying to hold which is about not publicly commenting on um, Harry's book is going to they're going to deviate from that right. um, th there's a definite feeling as certainly as far as my understanding is concerned is they they have nothing to gain by getting involved in a public tit for tat with him if they say this is not true then they're going to go say that is true that is not true it it just doesn't help anyone and I think they feel that they want you know fine if this is the road he wants to go down get it off his chest they're just going to weather this storm and then get on with what's important to them. Well, and speaking of that, obviously looming really into view now is the coronation. How mm. is all of this situation going to affect that with particularly Harry and William? Well, I wrote before Christmas that there was an open invitation to Harry and Meghan, very much taking lead from the late Queen, who said they were much-loved members of the family, that they would not be excluded from events. So there was a kind of an open invitation, even though the invitation hasn't gone out yet, to attend the coronation. And my understanding is that's not changed. But I just don't see, after what he said about his family, how Harry and Meghan can consider coming. Um, it would be a massive distraction on a really important day. And, you know, we've seen a claim in another newspaper today that, you know, other members of the royal family have said, we don't want them there, we're concerned about having them there, because we're worried about private conversations ending up in a paperback version of the book further yeah. down the line. And I think given the level of detail of private conversations and private interactions with uh, even text messages that have, you know, Harry's revealed in this book, that then, you know, they're well within their rights to be worried about that. I disagree. I think that, um, you know, they're shameless. Harry and Meghan are shameless. So they, they will be there. You know, they, they want to keep up the royal links. It's, it's good. Um, it shows they're still, you know, part of the royal family and they're very keen on that. They've got no intention of giving up their titles. 
So, and I think we saw a very important development at the weekend when it was revealed that the royal dukes won't all have to sort of swear allegiance to the new monarch. It will just be William. Now, what that means is that Harry and Meghan can go. They can sit together. They're there kind of as observers, as guests, like the President of the United can States. Still write nasty things about the king later on. Exactly. Yeah, so I think they'll yeah. be there, pick up a bit of new gossip yeah. and uh, store it up for another programme. Right. Well, that's you two off to Ladbrokes then. Place you bet. <laughs> Let's see. Well, it wasn't that long ago that it wasn't always this way. So here are a few photos of when Willie and Harold were brothers and best mates. And just time to say thanks to Rebecca and Richard and to you, of course, for watching. And we will see you next week on Palace Confidential. Bye-bye.